Hey fellow fraud fighters, I'm Jimmy Fong, CCO at Seon, and welcome to the Cat and Mouse podcast. Seon is fortunate to work with businesses such as the likes of Revolut, New Bank and Patreon in the fight against fraud. But with this podcast, we want to provide a comfortable space for people to talk about the daily challenges, topics on the horizon, and ultimately give us all a better insight into the mindset of fraudsters. And with that, on with the show. Really, really excited to get uh, today going. We've got uh, Frank McKenna uh, from uh, Frank on Fraud uh, on the show today. So Frank, a massive uh, big welcome to you. Uh, uh, Good morning. Hey, thank you for having me, Jimmy. I'm excited to uh, be here today and talk to you about my favorite subject, which is uh, fraud. So uh, this should be a great conversation. <laughs> and what a following you've built up with uh, your own blog, Frank on Fraud. I just finished the, your this year's kind of top 10 fraud predictions. Uh, so yeah, thank you for being so generous on the information you share to the wider fraud fighting community uh, there, Frank. Yeah, I love to uh, write about fraud. And, uh, you know, I write probably two or three times a week just on things that I'm seeing out there. And it's been just fantastic just collaborating with people all across the world like yourself who kind of read it and they reach out to me. And I think that's the been the biggest thing from Frank on Fraud is just all the people I've met, all the fraud fighters that kind of pick it, pick up on it and want to talk to me. And yeah, and I learned so much from it. It's It's just incredible. That's so cool. And I, I see it popping up uh, like, uh, yeah, in all types of security kind of uh, media outlets now. So kudos to that growing uh, uh, base as well. That's uh, awesome. Um, and let's let's take a step back. So as you know, with our with our kind of chat, we often like to get into a bit of the history of, uh, you know, what got you started? You know, what was the, your first foray or adventure into kind of the fraud fighting space? Like, can you maybe share with the audience some of that that background? Yeah, it's really it's it's really interesting, but I think it's super typical. Um, I was it was 1990. I just gotten out of college. I was looking for a job. I found a job. It wasn't really a great job, but it was a customer service rep working for a credit card company. And if you know the 90s, it was all about credit cards were coming out, and everybody was looking for people to you know man the phones and talk to customers. And I did that job for about a year, and one day. I got a call from somebody that was impersonating an old lady. They were trying to, it was her grandson basically was trying to take over her account. Um, But he was impersonating her voice and I could tell. So I stood up and I talked to my supervisor and I said, Hey, what do I do with this call? Because I don't think it's a customer. And they said, transfer to the fraud department. And I was like, wow, that sounds like such a cool, (laughs) a cool part of the, you know, company that I want to work for. So I, I transferred it to the fraud department. I ended up talking to a lady there. And over the course of three or four months, I was transferring a lot of calls to her because I I was intrigued. And every time I get a call and if I didn't think it was a customer, I'd transfer to her and we had these conversations. And all of a sudden, one day, a job opened up in the fraud department. I applied for it. I really wanted it so badly because I just knew this was going to be fun. Um, I told the hiring manager I worked for free for six months. And if they didn't, if they didn't like me, they could fire me just because I wanted it so much. So I really kind of fell into it. It was a stroke of luck. And from there, that was 1991, I think. And ever since, that's all I've done. And I've loved every minute of it. Yeah, that's amazing. Did, did you, uh, just a point of detail, did you hang on to that uh, line? Did you get to observe what your, your colleague in the fraud department, kind of how their conversation went? Uh, or did you drop off? I uh, did not get to hang on, but she called me back about 10 minutes later and said, you were right. It was an account takeover. Uh, thanks for transferring it over. If you ever get that transferred to me, and uh, so yeah, it was a fraud. So that's a, that's an interesting topic, right, Frank? Is like you were talking nineteen, uh, you know, in the nineties there, and ATO as like in its most kind of yeah, kind of telco fraud, uh, like you said, the grandson. So so ATO still. What I think that was one of the fraud predictions, uh, kind of quoted out. Uh, it's, it's an everlast, an evergreen problem. You know, yeah, that's the thing is when we we look at that, one of the things I did at the end of that predictions blog is I said, fraud is always the same. It's just got a twist. And since 1990, the fraud schemes that I encountered in my very earliest days are still there. They just have a little twist to them. And they're just grown like you'd not believe. Like I've got to see the 30-year transition of fraud. And it's just crazy what fraud was and what it is now. 
Um, yes. Unbelievable. And if I was to kind of kind of zoom through some of that amazing experience you've had, um, you've kind of spent uh, the the last kind of thirty odd years kind of uh, kind of uh, going up from fraud analyst uh, through to uh, some amazing financial service names, uh, Wells Fargo, uh, the FICO organization. And it looked like you got more strategic in terms of setting up the kind of risk ops function yeah. within those teams. Yeah, it's a it, yeah. If there's a if there's been a job in fraud or a role in fraud, I've probably done it. Luckily, and and I just when I start out as a fraud analyst, I always had that position. I saw somebody's job that I wanted, and I'd always strive to get that job. So when I was a fraud analyst. I looked over and I saw the fraud investigators who were doing more in-depth investigations and recoveries. And I said, I really want that job. And I got that job. And then when I was doing that, I started to look at the fraud strategy people who were writing the rules and using the tech within the company. And I got that job. And then I started to look around on the internet and I saw these cool job postings at other companies. And I was like, okay, I'm going to apply for that. Um, and then in about 1997, I went to a conference in San Diego. It was a fraud conference, one of the very first fraud conferences for a company called Agency Software. They make the product called Falcon, which mm. probably about 85% of the credit card companies in the world use. I went to the conference and I was so supercharged by like the energy at this conference because there, this is a tech company that was at the forefront of fraud detection. And um, I reached out to a couple of people there and I was like, hey man, maybe this is, something I can get into is move from banking into tech. And about six months later, a job opened up and I, and I made that transition and it was fantastic. But it was also really scary because when you go from a bank where you have control to a tech company where you're kind of influencing banks and you don't really have any direct control, you really have to work on your communication. You really have to work on your influencing skills. And so that was just, I just loved making that transition. And then from there, you know, everybody has a good idea, right? When you worked in fraud, you everybody has this idea of how things maybe could be better. And you know what? You can actually take that idea you have and start a company. <laughs> and that's where I went in the night in 2004 as we started with my partner, Tim Grace, who I'm still with uh, here at Point Predictive. We said, hey, we have a great idea. Let's start a company. And we did that twice. So yeah, there's a there's just no shortage of opportunity in fraud, especially now if you're starting out. It's such a great career choice. I mean, there's so much you can do. And and for me, I take a lot of Frank uh, like that almost uh, insatiable curiosity you had when you were working your when when you were kind of working through those different roles. And like you said, you observed, hey, that looks kind of cool. I, w I wonder how I'd go about doing a good job there. And um, from from you, if you were to uh, distill. Uh, some of those character traits that helped you kind of move upwards uh, in that kind of fraud uh, fighting career path. Uh, what would you share were important, uh, you know, as part of that? Yeah, number one, yeah, that's a good question. But number one, if you love fraud, you're going to be great at it. So if you're if you love it, just know you can make it work. Number two, I'd say it was really always taking on any opportunity. And, and this happens at, when you're in your job and people say, who wants to, can anybody volunteer to do this? I would always say yes, because every time you say yes, it's a learning opportunity and you're just more valuable to the company. So I think that was probably the trait that really helped me the most is always volunteering, even if it seemed like a lot of work. And even if it seemed a little mundane, it was just a learning opportunity. The third thing that I think I really had to hone in on was the communication through presentations, through mm -hmm. Excel sheets, through emails. You just have to be, you know, knowing what to do is only half the battle. Knowing how to convince others in the organization, especially if you're in a bank, to do that is really the other half. Mm -hmm. So you really have to become an expert at creating compelling presentations <laughs> compelling analysis and emails because half the time you're just convincing people to do the right thing. Um, and I think those were really the key things, you know, I'm not super technical guy, so I didn't have to become a coder. I didn't have to really, although I do know SQL, I didn't really have to spend a lot of time in there. My forte was really just more on the communication side and trying to, trying to convince people, I guess you could say. <laughs> 
those yeah. would be my those would be the main traits i think yeah so that's, that's that's really good insight especially especially with the dynamic that oftentimes um with uh the analysis that you might be picking up the patterns you're trying to pick up you need to exact change right it's what one side of it is the the kind of being able to see kind of the information but the second bit which is arguably probably harder right is to exact change from all that exact the change you're right and there's one that i left off it's super 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 critical one is the attention to detail if you're in fraud management never you i always say this if you're going to write a rule write a fraud rule you really have to understand that rule you have to understand look at all the accounts that it fires on and just understand to a minute level of detail because the devil's always in the detail so i think that attention to detail in fraud is so critical because the name of the game in fraud is reducing false positives. That's like the main thing, right? You can write a great rule, but you got to reduce false positive. So I think that would be just, I want to add one more trait there because I think it's, it's super critical too. That's amazing. Um, and then zo zooming out a, a, a bit uh, there, Frank, especially with, uh, and congrats on yeah, the, the kind of foray into the tech and into the business side of things of, Point predictive. Um, I, I guess that's brought you all around the world uh, in security conferences with clients and prospects. I, I guess that's rounded out even more uh, kind of experience and view from from your side. Yeah, it's like this is one of the things. Like the if you could tell somebody you can do what you love and travel the world, and you know you have found a really great career. I think like here in the U.S., the Army and the Navy were the ones that started that. But in fraud, you really can travel the world because it's a global problem. And I started really traveling outside the United States in about 1998 when I went up to Canada and they were really struggling with fraud. And I actually relocated to Canada for about a year, year and a half, and worked with all the banks up there. And then after we helped all the banks in Canada solve fraud, fraud uh, jumped over to the UK. And I spent probably another three years traveling. And I was in Edinburgh for about a year and a half in London. I think I've made 50 trips to London over the years, uh, just helping banks with fraud. I went to Japan. I got a chance to go to Australia, Mexico, US, here in the US, all over South America, and just talking to people and helping them with fraud. And the interesting thing about it is every country has the same issue, but there's just subtle nuances. And so if you can, if you understand the basics of fraud, you can actually go around the world and you can solve the same problem over and over again and help lots of people. You mentioned in the pre-chat that you observed actually those differences in approaches as well. Uh, yeah, curious to... Yeah, kind of unpack that a little bit. Did yeah. you see differences in Asia, for instance, uh, and how they approached uh, fraud fighting? Yeah, it's interesting. And in, uh, I'll talk about Japan in particular, because in Japan, they did have a lot of credit card fraud in the 2000s. Um, mm -hmm. When we went to Japan, and I we went and we were watching them work fraud cases, and they never actually would pick up the phone and call anybody. And they would never block anybody. But what they would do is like send an email to the customer and say, please very respectfully call the bank. Um, and I was always like, well, you got to call, you got to block that account. And they, in Japan, it was just a taboo. You just would not disrespect the customer by blocking their account at the time. I don't know if it's changed. So yeah, this is some of the things, a technique that I would say, if you have a credit card fraud, block the customer's account, call them right away, make sure they have their card. But there it was all, you know, it was very kind of a roundabout way. Um, and they would try to reach the customer and they ultimately would block the account mm -hmm. when they talk to the customer. But that was just one of those things that culture can dictate fraud controls, right? Um, and I think um, you have to be sensitive to culture when you go around to different places. You can't just make blanket recommendations that you made in the UK to Japan or vice versa, because they just simply wouldn't work. So that was that's pretty interesting. I, I know in a, a few Telegram groups that were shared, uh, I think in between the Christmas New Year's period, I, I remember there was a little snippet from one uh, actually recognizing and taking advantage from a fraudster's point of view of some of those nuances on how they dealt with fraud controls. And some of them were linked to 
really weird, th very specific things like you just mentioned is a, a culture's maybe non-direct approach. They would always do certain warnings over certain time frames, and that was actually being exploited from the other side as well. It's, um, I, I guess, it, you can kind of think of it on both sides. Yeah, exactly. Right. The the I always say Telegram is kind of an amazing glimpse into fraud culture that most of us have never had before. And it's so open that as a fraud fighter, you can go in there and see what we're doing on the side of fighting fraud. They're doing exactly the, the exact opposite, but they're doing it a lot better because, <laughs> because they, you can go into these groups with 100,000 people talking to each other, but banks to share the same information have to go very in clandestine and maybe do back channels and talk to each other and they have to be very tight lipped. So I think, you know, if there was a telegram for, for fraud fighters to share the same things, it would be great because I think the fraudsters are kind of winning that collaboration and communication um, it, war. I find it crazy, just to add, Frank, I find it crazy that uh, out of that 100K odd uh, folk in that telegram group, you know, a good 30, 40K, 50K might be fraud fighters, right? Just sitting in, mm. but there's like, no, that doesn't matter, right? It's, it it's, doesn't uh, matter. And that's what's yeah. crazy. Yeah, and I see, I do see my blog posted, like when I mm -hmm. kind of talk about something that I found on Telegram, it, it immediately gets posted in a Telegram to those groups, and they say, and they actually like it. They actually <laughs> are proud that they've been mentioned in uh, these fraud fighting, you know, articles. So it is kind of, it's a weird dynamic, yeah, that it's, why is there no fear anymore of fraud? And that spells a lot of trouble, I think, the fact that there's no stigma to fraud. That just means more people will do it. Yeah, and it, I think it is just an absolute um, a conscious rec understanding that silos exist on the good guy side, right? Because of regulation, because of um, policy, because of competition, it, because it exists, and that's it's, it's so horrible because it it's just a it's just a structural dynamic thing that you can't really change from. You know, you can't. And a lot of it is is not. It's not right, right? So people, yeah. banks, I know having worked for a bank, like they're very tight-lipped for no good reason. And one of the reasons that I hear all the times is there's a competitive advantage to fraud. Like if yeah. we are better, there's a competitive advantage. That's like saying there's a competitive advantage to get a vaccine, right? If if you, if other, if not everybody gets the vaccine, it just keeps running on and it comes back. Like Omicron's a good example, right? It, everybody get vaccinated, but if a large part of the population doesn't, it comes back stronger and stronger. The same is true with fraud. We, can, we have to work together to eliminate it, not take our siloed approach and maybe just protect ourselves because it will come back in a mu mutated form, you know, like we see with fraud with a twist, and it'll come back and get you worse in the future. So I just think collaboration is so critical, and we can't be afraid of it. What's the kind of nub to that? So the, the the kind of the nub of that argument is essentially how do we share you know the best knowledge without exposing that kind of uh, competitive elements that our our uh, employers or our tech companies don't want to expose? A any kind of thoughts on that, Frank, from your side? Yeah, I think it, I think the fact is you can share your techniques with each other. Uh, without sharing your absolute rules, right? You don't want to share your parameters of your rules and things like that, but you can still share the technique that you used. Um, so I think there's a, there's enough to share without being tight-lipped, right? The second thing is you just want to understand your audience, right? You don't want to post your rules out on LinkedIn where public can view. If it's a, if it's a round table type of community like in Ariyama and those, you can freely share your rules. And I've run so many roundtables where operational roundtables where people are sharing their information with each other. And it is so hard, even in these roundtables where it's all fraud fighters sitting around the room for getting people to share because they're worried what their boss is going to think back if they share something. And so that's actually nonsense because you're with other fraud people, you're helping them, they're helping you. The more you communicate, the more they're going to communicate with you and give you good ideas. So I just feel like in those groups, don't be afraid to stand up and speak. So I think 
that's a that's a that's another point I would make. And the third is, um, you know, I just I just think that people I write I write blogs and I've been like people have come back to me and say, "Why wow, you shouldn't be sharing that?" Because like the Telegram stuff, like you should not be sharing these things that they're doing because then they're going to know that we know. And I'm like, <laughs> that's exactly what I want is I want them to know that we know exactly what they're doing so that they know that we're fighting. it. So I, it's just, I think there's too much fear of sharing. That is not a valid fear. I just think it's a fear with nothing, nothing behind it. Um, I, it reminds me of a, a conversation I had at the back end of last week with um, a CRO over at a Neil Bank, a challenger bank. And uh, they said something that was exactly along those lines. They were talking about how oftentimes it's these self-imposed restrictions we have as fraud fighters uh, to exactly that of, it could be, what will my boss think? It could be, what will the business think? But it's self-imposed, these restrictions as a blocker, right? To where yeah. this information should be totally, uh, uh, it should be really free-flowing to kind of at least it even out a little bit. It should be. And I guess I would challenge your listeners is, when you're at a conference, get up and force yourself to give some really good information in that conference and watch what happens. Watch what happens to that conversation when you open up, what happens with others in the room. If you open up, they'll open up and the conversation and the value of that round table, the value of the sharing is gonna increase exponentially. Um, and you, I've seen it before, you know, I, I know that, that that will happen. That's awesome. Um, and just nipping in, we, we talk, talked a little bit about um, yeah, some of the insight that you can gather from uh, simply observing and jumping into these Telegram groups, which, uh, and with you, they're not that hard to find. That's the, the other thing about it, right? It's not like you have to search. You don't have to be a genius to find them. And super happy for you to join them as well. And so that's, that's tapping into the same resources to get into the head, into the literally tactical elements that are happening. Yeah. Would you recommend kind of other resources for fraud fighters? How else can they tap into uh, some of those things? Yeah, there's, um, so there's Telegram. So I've got the, I've got my go-to every morning um, when I go in. I look at, I go to Telegram and I'm always just seeing uh, what's happening there. What are the, I look, I do search terms like wave, slap in. There's these terms that fraudsters will use when something is really going gangbusters. And I got an interesting story about one I found about a week and a half ago, and I'll tell you in a second. But um, so Telegram, Flipboard, you know, setting up your Flipboard to find articles on fraud. Um, Carice Hendricks, listen to podcasts like yours, right? Go out and find the podcast and listening, listen to them while you're driving home or while you're on your Peloton bike or you're doing your exercise or whatever it is. I think that's that's something I do. I set up all my Google searches to look for articles. You know, I'm just kind of always taking in any information I can or about fraud, about all these different sources. Um, and it's amazing what you find out there. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what I'd recommend to get kind of really tap into what's happening out there. Cool. That sponge, that sponge of information, which was probably <laughs> that same sponge as you're kind of climbing the, the kind of ranks as a fraud fighter. Yeah, you always want to take in as much as you can because it's always changing what you know about fraud last week is not what's happening this week. <laughs> so you can yeah. never rest on your laurels, really. And uh, w one uh, kind of bullet I wanted to kind of tap into was, um, it was something from your fraud trends, your 22 fraud trends, which I, I know was done uh, in collaboration with yeah, kind of a, a number of, you know, really influential and amazing kind of uh, generous, again, speakers on, on this topic. But one of them you mentioned was the emergence of um, fraud for hire or, or crime as a service. Um, very curious to see kind of how, how alarming that's been from your point of view, uh, from an observation uh, side. Yeah, fraud for hire is, is really alarming. If you think about fraud for hire, people that sell their services to other people can make a lot more money than if they commit the fraud themselves, and it's a lot safer. If you think about the people that made them all the money in the gold rush here in California in 1849, it wasn't the miners, it was the people selling the pans and the shovels and the equipment to the miners. They're the ones that made all the money. And it's kind of the same concept with these fraud for hire services that are basically touting and selling these services on Telegram and Instagram and other social media. And it, 
kind of emerged in, I think, right around 2018, 19. I think Brett Johnson was one of the first people that kind of picked up on it and Chris Hendricks as well. And it started with these professional refunders who knew how to social engineer Amazon and Walmart to get your, if you ordered a computer, they would call the company for you and say, I didn't get the package and get a refund. And that it started slowly. They would, you know, I think in 2018, 19, there was a few of them and now there's mushroom and there's probably hundreds and thousands. And once they were successful with that service, they started branching out and offering other services like selling you bots. So you can, basically, you know, get a, run a bot that'll social engineer thousands of people and, and you'll get their one-time passcodes. Um, I'm seeing more and more of those services pop up, you know, monthly uh, basis on Telegram. I think we're just in the infancy of fraud for higher services. Hmm. So my, my, my prediction is that's just going to get probably worse and worse. And it's going to make the, the primary problem with it is you can be a newbie, you can know nothing about fraud, you can pay somebody a couple hundred dollars, and you can be like a full scale fraudster, making, you know, like, like Brett Johnson said, a million a year. That's, uh, that's the, that's the real problem with fraud for hires, it's turning everybody into professional fraudsters. That's the observation we've seen as well is the, is the fact has become, yeah, there is no skill needed. It's a, it's a SaaS service, right? Flipping it on its head. It's a readily available, insta available uh, service and very sophisticated. It's only becoming more sophisticated, which is, uh, which is uh, crazy, of course. Um, yeah. Frank, uh, this, has been a, this has been an awesome uh, conversation. Um, as part of our podcast, uh, we, we always uh, ask our uh, guests uh, on there. We're, we're known as the Say on Cat and Mouse podcast. And so I'm very curious on your take um, in the world of professional fraud fighter like yourself versus fraudster. Um, who who do you reckon is the cat in that scenario, and who's the mouse uh, from your point of view? <laughs> yeah, so who's the cat and who's the mouse? Um, gosh, there were the fraud fighters are the cat, and in some cases the mouse. So I think it can go either way. I really feel like the fraud fighters, though, ultimately at the end of the day, are the cat because I think. The fraud fighters are the ones that can get a kind of a, a wide view into lots of different trends. They can see, you know, where fraud is going. So if you're a really good fraud fighter, you know how to spot what's going to happen in the future. Um, and you can find the mouse, right? You look for those little telltale signs and, and catch the fraud. So I, I really view fraud as kind of like a cat would where you're trying to catch it and get rid of it and move on to the next. And so I think... Maybe that's how I'd view, but I think you could make an argument either way. That's a really <laughs> good question. <laughs> Frank, it's been an absolute blast. I uh, really appreciate you being on the show. I uh, thank you again for the generosity back into the community. Uh, Frank on Fraud, an amazing blog. If uh, you uh, aren't subscribed to it, highly recommended. Thank you again, Frank. Thank you, Jimmy. It's been great. <laughs>